everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Sea Level Rise Vulnerability Assessment Community Workshop today. My name is Jane Thornton, Associate Planner here at the City of Coronado. Here on the meeting with me as well is Rich Grineau, our Community Development Director, Jesse Brown, a Senior Planner, and our consultant team, Chris Webb, Connor Austin, and Jake Thickman from Moffat and Nickel, and we also have Diane Leone from PDC. So we're all going to turn off our screens now to not distract from the presentation itself, but we're going to turn them back on at the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Do that now. And just a quick note, this meeting is being recorded. And if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Questions can receive thumbs up or upvotes. So if you see a question that you want answered, give it a thumbs up and the questions with the most likes will float up to the top. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Uh, but for now, let's jump right in. So today we will be providing an overview of the city's sea level rise planning efforts, then diving into the recently completed draft vulnerability assessment itself followed by the next steps for the project and have time for some questions at the end. So again, if you're just joining, feel free to add any questions that you have to the Q&A box at any time. We will also have some live polling throughout the presentation. So Diane's going to jump in and explain how that works now. Hi everyone. So we'll be using Mentimeter, which is an online tool that will allow us to host live polling breaks throughout this presentation. So in order to participate, you'll want to have your smartphone or electronic device handy and visit the website menti.com. From there, you will enter the code listed on the screen, and this will direct you to a new page where you'll be able to respond to the polls throughout the presentation. The poll will be active until August 12th, so feel free to share this link with others after the workshop. But do note that if you are responding to the poll outside of the workshop, you will not be able to see the live polling results. Once the polls close, we'll generate a report summarizing the input received and we'll publish it on the Comment Coronado website. Now Jane will talk about the purpose of this project. Okay, thank you, Diane. So jumping into the purpose. The city's sea level rise planning project is funded by Caltrans grant and consists of three documents. The vulnerability assessment, which we just completed a draft of and are specifically talking about today, an adaptation plan and a combined report. The draft vulnerability assessment, which is now available on Comment Coronado, uses a model to forecast potential sea level rise in Coronado through 2100. The future adaptation plan will include a menu of potential adaptation strategies to mitigate effects of sea level rise. It will be tied to observable sea level rise, not modeling assumptions. And the purpose of this forward looking process is to inform city council, commissions and citizens of potential sea level rise impacts to aid land use and capital investment decisions. The plan is an informational document and creates no new regulations or obligations of specific projects for the city. The vulnerability assessment is the first piece of a cyclical planning process. It identifies appropriate sea level rise projections to study and potential impacts of sea level rise and it assesses the risks to resources and development. Uh, that's, that's where we are today. That's what we're pre presenting. Uh, the next step is to prepare an adaptation plan, which will include potential mitigation measures. In the future, as the city implements adaptation measures, it will be important to monitor progress and continue to revise the plans as needed. Let's talk for a moment about what causes the sea level to change. First, as land-based volume, water volume decreases, ocean volume increases. Second, as the ice caps and glaciers melt, ocean volume increases as well. 
Finally, as the ocean warms and the water expands, ocean volume increases and all of this leads to sea level rise. Now, whether you believe in climate change or not, the city wants to be prepared with information on how to protect our resources in the case that sea level rise does rise in the future. As I mentioned previously, any kind of strategies we might want to do in the future will be tied to observable sea level rise if it happens. So now Diane is going to lead you all through uh, some polling questions through Mentimeter. So time for our first polling break. So in order to participate, you'll want to have your smartphone or electronic device handy. And what you'll do is, what you'll do is access menti.com and input the code and you'll be able to participate throughout the presentation. So the first question is, what is your connection to Coronado? All right, looks like most of you live and work in Coronado and a handful of you are also interested in the regional dialogue on sea level rise. All right, time for the next question. What three words would you use to describe your feelings about sea level rise? So lots of good input so far. So you'll notice that the input is organized in a word cloud where words and phrases are highlighted based on frequency and relevance. So words that appear larger have more popular responses like inevitable, concerned, interested, anxiety, life-changing, and words that appear smaller are less common. All right, moving on to the third question. In your opinion, sea level rise is already impacting Coronado, will impact Coronado in 10 years, will impact Coronado in 50 years, or will not impact Coronado? So our results indicate that most of you believe that sea level rise is already impact, impacting Coronado and is a future concern within the 10 to 50 years. All right, now I'll give it back to Jane who will talk about the draft vulnerability assessment. All right, thank you Diane for going through those questions. It's great to see that you all are concerned and interested in learning more. 
Um, so jumping into the draft vulnerability assessment itself, and I'm seeing a hand up. So I just want to remind you all, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box, and we'll try to get to all of them at the end. Uh, but the vulnerability assessment was developed in four steps, which are to identify the city resources, then select scenarios and model. Third, to overlay model results with the resources. And finally, to analyze the vulnerability. So I'm going to go through each step in a little bit more detail. Firstly, city resources were identified. Um, resources are natural and man-made features that provide a benefit to residents, businesses, and visitors, such as infrastructure or recreational space. The city's resources were mapped and are identified on the table on the slide here. And we'll just take a quick break because we are very interested in learning what your top three priorities are from those city resources. So passing it back to Diane briefly. All right, next question. The following are resources the city could choose to protect it. Protect, select your top three priorities. Give you a few more moments. All right, looks like roadways is a top priority followed by public safety, critical city owned infrastructure. Still getting some results in. All right, roadways still in the lead and critical city owned infrastructure and public safety are neck to neck. All right, now I'll hand it back to Jane who will talk about the sea level rise scenarios. Great, thanks, Diane. So the reality is, you know, all of the city's resources matter, and that's part of why we're doing this, uh, is to understand what is at risk in the city and what can be done in the future as an option to protect our resources. Um, but going back to the vulnerability assessment itself, the next step was to select sea level rise scenarios to study. The study includes a range of sea level rise scenarios, um, sea I'm sorry, a range of sea level rise values in equal increments from 0.8 feet to 4.9 feet or a quarter meter to one and a half meter. So when might these increments of sea level rise occur? The timing is uncertain and the approximate timing is shown in the figure for three planning scenarios, low risk, medium risk, and medium high risk. Low risk has the highest chance of occurrence at 17% by the designated year. Medium risk has a 5% chance of occurrence and medium high risk has a 0.5% chance. 
So note that the over one meter scenarios represent low probability long-term projections, but again, the, the exact timing is unknown and we'll be sure to be uh, tracking the sea level rise in the future. With the sea level rise scenario selected, the next step was to overlay the model results with the resources. So in other words, to produce the sea level rise maps. The draft vulnerability assessment evaluates potential impacts of sea level rise using results of the United States Geological Survey, USGS Coastal Storm Modeling System, or COSMOS. This is considered the best available science for California. City staff worked very closely with our consultant to make sure that the model accurately depicted the city's features. But it's important to note that models are imperfect and they're based on human assumptions. So as I mentioned previously, the actual sea level rise will need to be monitored in the future and studied again as conditions change. And here I'll just remind you if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A box. And in the meantime, we'll be jumping slowly into those maps. So before we pull up the maps, let's discuss what the maps actually show. There are three coastal hazards depicted, which are predictions of shoreline erosion, temporary flooding during a hundred year storm, and inundation, which is defined as areas of daily wetting associated with a spring high tide, which occurs about twice per month. The maps on the following slides are broken up by area, so north, central, and south, and the results for half a meter, one meter and one and a half meters of sea level rise are shown. Uh, the rest of the maps are available in the full draft vulnerability assessment report, uh, which is on Common Coronado now. Uh, so if you're curious, you can check them all out there. So starting in the north at half a meter, there's storm flooding along the beach area and low lying areas along the Glorietta Bay shoreline. So those are the pink areas on the maps. The seawall along the beach prevents storm events from flooding inland areas. As a reminder, half a meter of sea level rise has a 0.05% chance of occurring by 2040 in the medium high risk case, 5% chance of occurring by 2050 under the medium risk case, and 17% chance of occurring by 2060 in the low risk aversion case. At one meter, storm flooding breaches a gap in the seawall, and flooding from the bay is more substantial and breaches at First and Alameda Boulevard. There's also inundation along the Glorietta Bay shoreline, which are the light blue areas circled on the map. This scenario has a 5% chance of occurring by 2080. And at one and a half meters, there are large areas of inundation, especially in the low-lying Spanish Bight and Glorietta Bay. The beach doesn't lose significant area because it is wide enough to migrate. So it may look concerning, but again, as a reminder, this scenario has a 5% chance of occurring at 2110 if nothing is done, according to the projections. So moving on to the central area at half a meter, there's storm flooding along areas of SR-75. At one meter, storm flooding becomes more widespread along SR-75 and inland areas. There is potential inundation at the lowest portions of SR-75. At one and a half meters, there's inundation along longer stretches of SR-75 and inland areas. Moving on to the south area, at half a meter, there's storm flooding in low-lying areas of Coronado Cays and select portions of SR-75. At one meter, significant areas of Coronado Cays are projected to be inundated under spring tide conditions. Uh, there's also additional storm flooding along SR-75. And at one and a half meters, there is a widespread inundation at Coronado Cays and inundation along select portions of SR-75. So yes, there, there are some potential concerning impacts. That is why we're doing this planning now, so we can be better prepared for what to do in the future. 
And just as a reminder here, the draft vulnerability assessment only shows the potential impacts, not the ways we might want to address them. So our next step in the process, the adaptation plan, will include options for sea level rise based on observed sea level rise and trigger points. And another reminder, should you have any questions, put them into the Q&A box. Now I know that was a lot of maps to go through uh, with those potential concerning impacts. So feel free to ask any questions as they come up. And I'm gonna be turning it now back to Diane for a couple more polling questions. All right, time for our last polling break. So again, to or in order to participate, you'll want to use your smartphone or electronic device and go to menti.com and input the code shown on the screen above to participate. Should the city prioritize projects that proactively help to mitigate for future sea level rise impacts? Yes, it looks like the audience is, feels very strongly about prioritizing. All right, our last question. Do you believe the city should consider future sea level rise impacts when investing in public projects and preparing long range planning projects. Again, many of you feel very strongly that the city should consider these impacts. All right, we'll jump back to Jane and she will talk about the final step of the vulnerability assessment. Great, thanks, Diane. So the final step of the vulnerability assessment was to analyze the vulnerability of each resource previously identified. So state guidelines recommends assessing vulnerability based on exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Exposure is the hazard type, duration, and frequency that a, sub that a resource is subject to. Sensitivity is the degree to which a resource is impaired by hazard exposures. And adaptive capacity is the ability of each resource to adapt to hazards. So all of those pieces combined lead to an overall vulnerability assessment for each resource. In our report, each resource in the inventory has its own cut sheet describing the results of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. The ratings are qualitative, so low, moderate, and high, but they also include a numerical score. So that numerical combination of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity lead to overall vulnerability scores. We don't have time to cover each resource individually, but we have an example cut sheet on the slide here and we'll walk through another one now. So looking at the ferry landing in more detail, for hazard exposure, no impacts are anticipated until one meter of sea level rise when storm flooding begins to temporarily impact operations, leading to a low exposure score at that point. Inundation begins at one and a quarter meter of sea level rise, bringing the exposure ratings up to high. The ferry landing is highly sensitive to sea level rise because of the requirement for coastal access. And the adaptive capacity is low because of the need for the coastal access um, and that limits opportunities for relocation or realignment. So all of those factors combined lead to the overall vulnerability assessment, which is low to moderate when no or minimal impacts are projected 
and high when inundation occurs. And the overall vulnerability is higher than resources that have a higher adaptive capacity, such as recreational facilities that can be relocated and do not rely on coastal access. So the table here lists the city's most vulnerable assets in order of decreasing vulnerability to sea level rise. Yacht clubs, stormwater outlets, roadways, especially SR-75, and development in low-lying areas are the most vulnerable resources in the city. Resources that are least vulnerable are generally not impacted at 4.9 feet, such as the fire and police departments, or they're highly adaptable, such as North Beach. The vulnerability assessment also includes an economic impact analysis. There are a number of limitations to the economic impact analysis, including that it is based on assessor data, which can differ from current market value, does not include the exact materials used for each resource, does not factor in inflation, and does not include construction estimates. So the estimates here are intended to be rough order of magnitude costs to be compared against each other in order to understand the relative scale of potential damages. For inundation, par parcel damage can be up to 1.5 billion at 4.9 feet of sea level rise. For storm damage, parcel damage can be up to 508 million at 4.9 feet of sea level rise. And damages to utilities and transportation infrastructure Estimates were estimated separately, uh, so they're shown here on your screens. So finally, I'll cover our next steps in the process. Besides today's meeting, we have a survey up on our Comet Coronado website now through August 27th, and we encourage you all to participate. You've seen some of the questions from the polling, uh, but it's a little bit lengthier and has a lot of great questions on uh, priority, priorities and adaptation strategies. This presentation will also be available on the website for you to review again or to share with others that might be interested. And we're also planning to present this exact same content at the library wind room on August 12th at 11 a.m. And then finally, I want to note that we have two fact sheets available on the website as well, in addition to the full report. So one is an introduction to the project overall, and the second one is a quick overview of the draft vulnerability assessment that we covered today um, in case the full report uh, is, is too lengthy for your needs. So next we'll be working on the adaptation plan that's coming up in the fall, and it will be ready for a review and discussion at that time. The project is scheduled to conclude this winter with the combined vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan. So now I wanna open up some time for questions. I know that was a lot of content. Um, Diane's going to read the questions and we'll do our best to answer them all, but feel free to keep dropping them in there and we'll turn on our screens as well. All right, the first question is, why observable versus assumptions or both? Okay, well, um, so we want to use observable sea level rise because as I mentioned, the um, exact timing of sea level rise, it's hard to predict. Some people will, you know, scientists are saying it's accelerating. History is showing something different. So before we invest any, um, huge city funds into any projects, we want to be observing that the sea is actually rising. Um, there will be, you know, some assumptions in that if we want to, so there will be trigger points. So for example, once we hit a quarter meter of sea level rise, that triggers the city to consider certain projects that would help when um, the sea is at half a meter. So hopefully that answers the question. Feel free to uh, elaborate a little more. Hopefully I understood the, the question on that one. Thanks, Jane. Next question. Will we be discussing other than city resources? How about residents living along the bay? 
Yeah, so that is included. That's the what development is. So development includes the private residences and commercial res, uh, commercial facilities, retail as well. Um, so that is included and shown on the maps. All right. What opportunities does Coronado have to get a collaborative response from other agencies to produce a more realistic sea level rise plan? So the city is currently collaborating with the Navy and State Parks, Port of San Diego. We've also been talking to Imperial Beach. So this process is kind of just the beginning. The vulnerability assessment really is just capturing um, what parts of the city, what resources are vulnerable. But as we move into the adaptation strategies, uh, because so much of our land is you know, mixed up with the port and the Navy, what we do may benefit their lands and vice versa. What they do may benefit us. So we'll definitely be continuing to collaborate with them moving forward. Where does California Coastal Commission live in this process? So this project is funded by a Caltrans grant and is an optional uh, process that the city is taking on. So Coastal Commission hasn't required us to do this at this time. Um, so they're not currently involved in the future, depending on adaptation strategies that may come into play. That's when they may be involved or if there's any changes to uh, documents, um, planning documents, they may get involved. But at this time, we're just kind of getting ahead um, of the curve and getting the, the vulnerability assessment done before it's required by Coastal Commission. All right, next question. Are you considering costs of sea level rise attributed to increased insurance premiums? Um, I'm not sure I understand that question or maybe Moffat and Nickel, do you all know how insurance premiums might play in? Hi, Jane. Uh, we did not factor in increased costs for insurance premiums in the uh, economic analysis. My understanding. Great, thanks for clarifying, Chris. Our next question, is there any science to support the various assumed scenarios? So Moffat and Nickel can definitely go into all of the technical details of the science, but we are using the best available science in California right now. So our consultants have used the guidance that's put out by Coastal Commission, as well as the Ocean Protection Council. So all of the latest guidance for the scenarios is what's being used. It's the same type of analysis that's being done across the state with different cities. Um, they're all doing it in the same way at this time. Is there anything, Moffin and Nicole, that you all would like to add about um, the science to support the scenarios? Jane, yeah, you actually hit it pretty well, but um, we're using what's termed the best available science by the um, state of California following the state of California guidance established in 2018 that Coastal Commission and other agencies tend to follow and cite. Um, it is based on real science, global um, measurements and um, other data that uh, feed into a federal government model developed by the United States Geologic Survey um, that we have applied to this site. And we've actually taken it one step further and tailored it a little bit based on results that we felt needed to be improved. Great, thank you, Chris. Next question. Are you aware of the Stormwatch data acquired by UCSD concerning the Kay's shoreline and Glorietta Bay in January 2021? Um, so I'm not aware of that specific data, or maybe it, we are aware, um, Chris and Connor, you all may have some thoughts on that. So as Chris mentioned, we were using the COSMOS data, which is considered the best available science. Um, we do know that UCSD and Scripps and other you know, local scientists have been studying sea level rise in our region. Um, and we will be coordinating with them in the future as well and trying to get their input as well. Um, but as far as the stormwatch data, 
that wasn't specifically factored in. Okay. I think if that didn't answer your question, feel free to add a little bit more, but hopefully that uh, addressed it. Thanks, Jane. Will the final adaptation plan contain actual budgetary items with a cost to mitigate and a time frame? So the adaptation plan will also include some rough order of magnitude costs as well. Um, as far as a time frame goes, it's going to focus more on those trigger points. So when the C reaches a certain level, this is when we may consider this kind of project. And again, it's only options for the city council to consider. So it's not committing the city right now to any specific um, financial obligations or project obligations. It's gonna be more of a toolkit for city council to consider as, as um, sea level rise is observed but it will include some of the costs um, and some information about how inflation might um, project that, but not specific. It will have timeframes in terms of um, those planning scenarios that we looked at earlier, like ideas of when we might need to consider this, but uh, again, that observable um, sea level rise and trigger points will really be what the report focuses on. And the cost to mitigate is an interesting thought and a good suggestion. Um, frankly, that wasn't really factored in yet to the costs that we've been looking at, but we can take that into consideration if it becomes necessary. So thank you for that thought. Great, thanks, Chris. All right, next question. The draft regional transportation plan, SD forward prepared by SANDAG, projects a 2.5 foot sea level rise by 2050 and 6.6 .6 feet by 2100. This seems to be a good bit more than so takes into account under the different risk levels. Should this disparity be addressed in adaptation planning measures proposed by the Coronado Adaptation Plan? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, those dates, about when sea level rise will occur. Again, those are, you know, those are guesstimates. And so the, the way that table set up, that one that showed when sea level rise may occur, um, those are based on risk aversion scenarios. So um, if you're planning for something that is highly sensitive to sea level rise, for example, um, an electric station, an electric, um, electric generating station. Um, you may want to be planning for further in advance. Um, our consultants can kind of clarify that a little bit better. But in regards to those reports, you know, they're saying there's going to be two and a half feet of sea level rise by 2050. But the reality is we don't know when there's going to be two and a half feet of sea level rise. There's a percent probability associated according to the best available science with when sea level rise might occur. So those 5% uh, chance, 17% chance, 0.5% chance that I'd walked through earlier. Um, they, those reports do look at higher sea level rise, like you mentioned the 6.6 .6 feet. And that's something we had talked about as a team, but because that's so far, down the line um, and those chances are so low. We, our report chose to look at incremental sea level rise with the idea that the process is cyclical. So as we move forward, you know, 6.6 .6 feet is very, very far away. Uh, as we move forward, once we see, you know, one, two, three feet of sea level rise, that's when we'll wanna redo our reports and use the new best available science to project what may happen at 6.6 .6 feet. So hopefully, Chris, does that uh, capture that information about? Yeah, it does. And, and, you know, I, I was listening to the question and I'm not sure I understood necessarily the title of the report, but I think from what I heard, it's the report that we actually um, contributed to. We prepared the sea level rise analysis for SANDAG for their regional transportation infrastructure guidance document. Um, in 2019, and we use those sea level rise scenarios. And so we're very aware of the results and what they mean and the ramifications for SR 75, for instance. 
And so, um, yes, we are familiar with it. And uh, we'll factor that into any analysis we do for the city of Coronado as appropriate. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. When was the last 100 year storm flooding observed? And is there any increase in frequency being noticed as there has been on the East Coast? So the last, one of the last big storms that people remember here in Coronado was the uh, December 20, sorry if somebody could remind me of the exact year of that storm. 2018. 2018, that was a 500 year storm. I'm not sure about the 100 year storms. Connor and Chris may remember, have some data on that um, and whether they're occurring more frequently. But some of these storms are not necessarily coastal storms. So what our maps look at are uh, coastal events. That 500 year storm actually wasn't a, it had precipitation, lots of rain, but very low um, tides or wave so what our maps are actually looking at is it, in the event that there's a hundred year storm, which could be associated with rain as well, uh, but also in combination with high waves, high tides. Um, Connor or Chris, do you guys have any information on how, how much more frequently these types of events are occurring? Yeah, sure. Um, but let, let me step back just a moment to say that some of the higher um, intensity ocean storm wave events were 1969, uh, 1982 and 83, and 1988. And the 1988 storm throughout portions of San Diego County was nearly an 80 year event. There has not been a 100 year coastal storm wave event in um, Southern California in my lifetime. And that spans a lot of years. So. <laughs> Um, I haven't seen one. I think <clears throat> we'd have to dig back into the early 1900s potentially to find one. So the frequency is not increasing. The, the frequency of such extreme events are not increasing at this point yet here. Great, thank you, Chris. Next question, are you using the wealth of information available from Imperial Beach? Yeah, so as I mentioned previously, we are coordinating with Imperial Beach and tracking what they're doing. Their assessment was done prior to uh, 2018, I believe it was 2016. So they were using the best available science of that time. So our approach is a little bit different um, using the, the newest maps. Uh, but yes, we are um, aware of their reports and coordinating with them. All right, next question. Some of the reference documents are quite old. Will the final vulnerability and adaptation plan contain more current data? Uh, so the best available science that's being used, the guidance is from 2018. Um, so that's the, what's most, um, that's just the freshest available uh, data. And the Cosmos data is, um, has been updated as well as Chris mentioned, tailored to our uh, specific conditions. So um, some of the referenced, you may be referring to some of the documents in Comet Coronado that are created by others, um, our neighboring jurisdictions, like what Imperial Beach has. Um, so that's their documents, but we're using the freshest available science documents. Thanks, Jane. The seawall by Centennial Park was recently rebuilt. Was this a sea rise issue? Uh, Rich, do you have any information on that one? So that would have been a port project in all likelihood that or a private development project. And I don't have any insight. My best guess though, is that it was just because it was deteriorating and decaying and they wanted to uh, reinforce it. Great, thank you. How is history showing sea level rise is not happening? So um, that's a good question. So what we're seeing from historical trends is that there has been about 10 inches of sea level rise in the past hundred years. So it's not that sea level rise, it's not happening. It's that it's been happening slowly. Now the scientists are projecting that it's going to happen faster. 
Um, you know, whether or not you believe that there's a lot of scientific backing for why that might be happening, but regardless of whether, uh, whether or not you believe it is happening in that rate or, um, you know, it will happen at that rate, what Coronado wants to focus on, it's important to, to track the observable sea level rise. So maybe it will take another hundred years for 10 inches. Maybe not, but that's why we'll be working with the tide gauges in the bay and out in Imperial Beach to see if the sea level rise is actually rising as fast as the scientists are currently predicting. Thanks. How often will you reassess the projected threat? So we don't have a specific um, time frame for when we would redo the vulnerability assessment. We're um, you know, working on this grant funded project now. And uh, I think that would be a lot tied to how much the science is changing and you know, how much sea level rise is actually happening. So the city will decide, city council will give direction on when to reassess. Um, but hopefully this report stays fresh for quite a while. Next question, how does sea level rise impact the city's plans for the new wastewater treatment facility at the golf course? The sea level rise uh, is, is not a consideration for that particular facility because the purpose of the water treatment plant would be to provide uh, recycled water to irrigate the golf course and city park, city medians and Orange Avenue. If the uh, golf course gets flooded and inundated on a regular basis, there won't be a need to irrigate it. And so that plant would be decommissioned. Thanks, Rich. Since the ferry landing is in the tidal overlay zone, shouldn't redevelopment of the ferry landing marketplace require mitigation for sea level rise? The ferry landing uh, lies within upper tide lens jurisdiction. Um, so at the end of the day, that's going to be the, the San Diego's decision on whether or not it redevelops. The uh, city of Coronado, while it's, it's uh, within our city limits, does not exercise any authority on that particular property. Um, I, I can imagine, though, that the port would take that into consideration for its uh, intense, significant new development on that property, and it would all be required to go through their permitting process. Thank you. Could sea level rise cause high rise buildings like the Coronado Shores collapse like the condo in Florida two weeks ago? No, I wouldn't want to speculate. Uh, you know, as, as to the extent of the sea level rise could have, you know, on Coronado Shores or other uh, private developments, uh, certainly could have impacts. Uh, my my non-engineering guess is that it would not create the type of sudden uh, collapse that we saw in South Florida. It's different circumstances, and um, I, I don't think the situation is similar in this case. Thank you. Was an analysis of the economic effects on public beaches and visitation in the scope for this project? Uh, yes, the, there was some analysis of the economic impacts on the beach. We're very fortunate here in Coronado to have such a wide beach. So actually there's very little economic impact on the beach uh, because it's so wide. So we're very lucky with that. Um, but that information is in the report, uh, the full vulnerability assessment report. Thank you. Should the city require all high rise buildings to have engineering structural reports done? So the adaptation plan may have some suggestions for, um, you know, what buildings may have to do or what planning doc, what our zoning may require. Um, so we don't know right now if that's something that would be in, in the adaptation strategies. All right. And does the California Coastal Commission have any input or similar assessments? So this the California project, this, this ahead, sorry. Coronado's project is not being done at the California Coastal Commission. We're not doing it to 
entitle any type of development. So they do not have any purview uh, over our plan. All right, how fast has sea level risen in past 20 years? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, that's uh, about 10 inches over the past 100 years. Not sure about exactly the past 20 years, um, but that's something that we, that about Chris may know off the top of his head. About a third of an inch over the last 30 years. Okay, great, thank you. All right, looks like there's two more questions. Can we access individual assessments for assets like yacht clubs? Uh, yes, so all of that, every resource has its own cut sheet and that's a part of the full report, which you can access on the Comet Coronado website. So after this meeting, um, we will send out the recording sometime early next week and that will also be up on the website. So we'll include a link to the website if you don't already have it. Uh, but that's where you can access all the documents, the fact sheet, the recording, and then very importantly, the survey that we would love for you all to take. How has sewage flows from Tijuana taken into account in your projections? So the sewage flows were not a consideration. The um, Cosmos maps looked at projected sea level rise um, without that factor. Thank you. And then since Silver Strand is designated as an official evacuation route, will this roadway take top priority? So I think uh, obviously, you know, the, the thing that's unique about Coronado is our geography and that there's really only two ways to get in and out of Coronado into the mainland. Uh, so the Silver Strand and the Coronado Bridge and maintaining the structural integrity uh, of those facilities, I, I got to think, are going to be amongst our top priorities. And we would certainly want to collaborate not only with uh, Imperial Beach, the Navy, but state parks and the port. Um, you know, it's a regional asset. There's, uh, there's a lot of different agencies and people that rely on that infrastructure. So when the time comes, uh, it would be our intention to try to collaborate with many local, state, and, and possible federal agencies uh, to buttress up those facilities and make sure they're safe and remain passable. Thanks, Rich. Those are all the questions so far. Jane, do you want to conclude? Yes, thank you all so much for the questions. Um, we really appreciate your time tonight. I know that was a lot of content. So should you think of questions later um, or have any comments, please feel free to email me. My contact information is on the screen here, my phone number as well, and on the Comet Coronado website, all of that um, contact information is available as well. So please do take our survey um, that really makes an impact and will be integrated into our reports. And uh, we really thank you for your time. And as a reminder, before we log off, Jane, we do have another uh, workshop coming up here at the Coronado Library on August 12th. Yeah, August, August 12th at 11. So there'll be another opportunity to uh, proceed if you'd like. We're going to try to continue to remain engaged with the public. And as Jane said, we, we welcome and invite your participation. Thank you. Great. Thank you again.